So thank you both for agreeing to speak with us today about the future of retail. I think it's an exciting topic because it's no secret that everyone loves to shop. Uh, shopping brings us discovery, drama, gamification, even transformation at times. So to start off, I know that Rent the Runway launched its mobile application in 2013 and since still brings in near 40% of its web traffic from mobile. Uh, Gilt and other big retailers use a mobile-first strategy, and Scarlett, you've been on the board of a lot of these companies that do use a mobile-first strategy. So in today's world, how important is mobile to retail? Uh, so first of all, can you hear me? I think so fun. Is it working? I did switch it off. I'll just switch to this. Can you hear me now? So first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. I must say that when I graduated Yale, I did absolutely nothing in tech while I was there. And it's so nice to see uh, so many people here today uh, focused around that topic. So um, great to see. Thanks for having me. I also say it's, uh, it's a little tough to follow Henry, who not only has lots of stories, but is also a great storyteller. So I don't know that we can match the, uh, the energy level that he had, but we'll do our best. Um, and uh, so moving on to, uh, to mobile, um, you know, eMarketer last year had estimated for this year that uh, the, U the U.S. online retail market would be you know, somewhere around $300 billion. And of that, um, the estimate was that 19% would be mobile. And, um, you know, I was just looking at some data yesterday around what is being seen today. You know, Critio, an online advertising company, that we know well and uh, does a lot of work with global e-commerce companies today is saying, and in their most, last, uh, most recent report, that 30% of that online retail market is now coming from mobile. So, so clearly the market is growing, it's growing very fast. Um, you know, the, the growth rate for mobile commerce is you know, 30% as opposed to online retail in general, which is more in the sort of 12 to 15% range. So, you know, clearly an interesting area. Obviously everyone here is carrying a phone today. You know, the, the penetration of smartphones uh, throughout the world has, has really uh, lent itself to, to mobile being uh, such a great way for people to access information, access purchasing uh, on, uh, on, on their device. So um, it's not so much, you know, as we look at it as investors, you know, the question is no longer do you have a mobile strategy, but what in fact is the mobile strategy? So, you know, it's very rare now, you know, and I tend to focus on growth, as Ali mentioned, um, but if you, if you look at, you know, some of the companies that are coming in, even at the early stage side, the difference is really how is that mobile experience? So I, I think where there's still work to be done and, and still really interesting opportunity is making that experience as user-friendly as possible. I still feel there's a lot of friction in terms of the process of purchasing, you know, the, the applications um, are not totally optimized uh, necessarily for mobile devices. You know, you want to have a, an experience where the user can very quickly see what's happening, very quickly get to a point where they can make a purchase. And that's where I feel that there's still some friction. So there's been a lot of improvement, more to be done. And of course, that's reflected in some of the conversion rates you see where they're still lower on, on mobile devices relative to what you see on the desktop. I'll, I'll chime in with just a few observations on mobile that we've seen. One is to me, when I hear mobile first, I actually think of that in terms of our development strategy. So we started to develop on mobile devices prior to developing online on the web. Um, and I love that. I'm obsessed with the, the fact that we can now work more quickly. We can be forced to simplify things, which is really so important in the world of e-commerce. Um, another thing I'd say that is that in the world of retail, especially as you start to go offline, um, which Rent the Runway has recently done with some brick and mortar stores, there's amazing ways in which mobile can blur the lines between e-commerce and physical brick and mortar stores. Because all of a sudden you have a device in each consumer's hand that could enable you to find out so much information and details about who that consumer actually is. When in the past, someone walking into a physical store, you don't really know who they are, right? So you're not armed with the same personalization abilities as you are typically in e-commerce. Um, so I think those two things alone have so many more, so many opportunities for mobile to play a bigger and bigger role as companies evolve. So as you brought up, um, a lot of companies today are making that switch from online to offline. I know that Rent the Runway has done this quite successfully and is now in New York and Las Vegas. Uh, we had Nasty Gal all over the news for their opening of their first brick and mortar store as well. Um, I'd love to hear some of your views on the pros and cons of going from an e-commerce online platform to um, uh, a physical location. 
Do you want to Should I start? Sure. sure. Um, so also, great to be here and wonderful to see all of you in the audience and so engaged. I am so thrilled that Yale has become such a supporter of entrepreneurship, technology, and there's so many amazing things that they are doing in the space right now. Um, Rent the Runway for me has been a, a dream, amazing company to build. Um, who here has heard of Rent the Runway? Yay, and who has tried Rent the Runway? Okay, given that like 80% of you are, are men, I'm gonna take that as a good <laughs> percentage. Um, but so we rent designer dresses and accessories. Um, we've been around for about six years now, and most recently we've introduced a retail strategy starting a couple of years ago, and that stemmed from our customers constantly asking us, can we try on your dresses? Can we see them in person? Can we feel them in person? And many people who were not yet our customers telling us that that was kind of their friction point. They were like, eh, you know, like, rentals, new concept, but if I could like try it on, I would know that it fit and it would just give me that confidence to talk to someone in person, ask them all my questions that I need to get over the hump and try rental. So we heard it enough that we said, you know what, we've got the e-commerce thing grooving, we're going to keep hard on that, that's going to be the core of what we are as a company, but let's start experimenting with retail. And whenever we evolve our strategy um, as, a, as a startup, we are constantly doing what I call minimum viable product testing where we're inching our way, we're crawling rather than walking or running into the new strategy. So with retail, that meant throwing up a store inside our office where we could just watch what was happening. We spent you know, less than $10,000. We started inviting customers in in a very quiet way to come try on our dresses. And we're like, let's see what this does to conversion. Let's see what the average order price is. Um, is this going to be profitable? Is it standalone profitable? How does it interact with the website? And the results were off the chart. Conversion was over 70%, which you know, online conversion numbers are typically in more in the three to 10% range. Um, average order values were twice what they were. And I would say, most importantly, it was letting us see our customers really interact with the product in a way that just draws new insights every single day. So when you can watch a customer physically interact and hear what they're saying to their friends or whoever they're bringing with them in a shopping experience or to our stylists, you start to learn so many things that you can actually apply online. Um, the other thing it did is it got us thinking about what could the interplay be between physical retail stores and online e-commerce. Um, and, and that's actually a lot of how our, our retail strategy has evolved to date. So now we have two stores in New York. Um, we have one in DC and we're opening one next week in Chicago. Um, so if anyone's from that area, it's, it's gonna be gorgeous and, and we'll be out there kind of launching and opening the store. Um, and, and what we've started to do is we've used our retail stores to enhance our online experience. So you can do things now, like you can pick up your order in store which many companies have that, that may not seem revolutionary, but for a company like Rent the Runway that is very event focused, it means that a woman can come in on a Friday, she can try her dress on, which is, is very revol you know, revolutionary for us. If it doesn't fit, there's thousands of other dresses in the store, she can swap it, she can talk to a stylist. She can accessorize her outfit, which means you know, extra revenue for us, but for her it actually lets her play and try on a bunch of different things. We've experimented with hemming services, so if the dress needs a little bit of a hem, you know, she brings her high heels, and she can get it hemmed for her special night out with a temporary hem. Um, so for our business in particular, because that event was often the next day, um, that occasions were such high stakes occasions at someone's wedding, et cetera, women you know, really wanted a way to get the experience to be perfect. Um, so, so that's you know, a way in which I'd say our strategy is a little bit unique. We've also seen a huge halo of marketing benefits from our store. So we ac actively track you know, in the New York area and the Chicago area, once we launch a physical retail store, what does it do to the lift online for our online business? And of course, you have to track cannibalization as well. But for our online business, we see a large boost in halo effect. And we actually attribute our retail stores as a marketing expense in a way. Um, so in, in, that, in that venue alone, it's been hugely effective. Um, our goal is to make our retail stores standalone profitable in year one. Um, we are close and we believe we can do it, which is great. But I think to speak to some of the cons, because I've, I've talked about a lot of the pros of retail, you know, some of the cons initially are it's not as quick, you can't scale as quickly. So it's, it's amazing to see both the Rent the Runway and so many startups what e-commerce has done in terms of letting us scale and grow very quickly. We have five million members to Rent the Runway. To do that in a retail capacity would be far more challenging. We've built a real brand that has um, significance throughout the US, throughout the world to some extent, to our consumers. To do that with retail um, just takes more time. So I, I love that we've been able to do that with e-commerce. And then retail can be expensive, and you're often locking yourself into multi-year leases. So um, again, whenever we can get a two-year sub-lease or a five-year lease, we do it. But often, to get the best spaces, you need a 10-year lease, which is a huge 
a huge kind of financial commitment that you're making. If you're doing it, especially as your first step as a business, that's a big risk. Maybe you're doing it without all the information you'd ideally have and that you'd be able to garner online. Um, and that would, I'd say, be my, my final point is that I think when you think of pros, cons, I go back again to the comment I made about the information you're armed with as an online business versus a physical brick and mortar business. And I do think, you know, someone comes to your site, and you know what their past browsing behavior is. You often know what other websites they have been to. You know where the, what region they live in. You know what their searches have been before, what size they are. You know, maybe what event they have coming up because they've indicated that before. Um, so I think just the ability to service a customer online is often so much higher touch, so much more focused and personalized. Um, and there's a lot of benefits that can come with that. Yeah, so so for us, uh, from an investor standpoint, you know, we're definitely seeing the trend you know, with the e-commerce companies that we meet with. I feel like we're hearing a lot more about having some sort of strategy around offline, be it showrooming, be it pop-ups, or be it you know, a full physical store like Brenda Runway has. So definitely a trend and a sign that there are still things in the online channel that just aren't figured out, right? So the sensory piece, which Jenny was just talking about, you know, the ability to touch, to feel, to sample, to really see what the item is. Um, the ability to have you know, discovery throughout a store, right? So you can walk around, you might go in for one thing and then all of a sudden you find something else. So you know, the online companies I think are trying to solve that by presenting to you some, some very curated and some very uh, different or, 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 or tailored things that you wouldn't necessarily see otherwise. Um, but that's still something that's in progress, it isn't completely figured out and I think the, the physical experience still doesn't quite match that. Um, the other thing is, you know, from an education standpoint, you know, sometimes with these larger purchases that are more expensive, the ability to have somebody in the store who can actually educate the customer and really try to sell them on the concept. And this is not so much on the fashion side, but, you know, maybe electronics or something like that. Um, there's definitely something there. And again, the online guys are trying to mimic that and do their best to, you know, have more content around a purchase, to tell stories around purchases. And we're actually really big believers in, in the marriage of content plus commerce as, as a real differentiator. Um, the other thing is obviously instant gratification, right? You walk away with the item, which Jenny just talked about. You know, so the online world is, is, is doing a lot in terms of fixing that. You know, there's obviously been some, some acceleration in shipping. We've seen shipping times really decelerate um, in terms of you know, being two weeks, three weeks, and now we're seeing things like one-day shipping. You know, I don't know if anyone's tried out Prime Now, which now can even deliver within two hours here in Manhattan, or if you're willing to pay the $7.99, it's within an hour, right? They're delivering uh, to your trunk of your car now, too. Oh, is that I the latest that one. thing? Even if you're not in your car, packages can be placed in your car. Right. It, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. So, uh, and, and delivering to, to, to stores, as you were saying, which is another way that they do that. And then finally, the last piece that's still missing in the online experience is, you know, that social aspect, right? So you're going to the mall with your friends or you're going to the store with your friends and that ability to share the experience together. So again, I think the online guys are making some really interesting strides with social media, with the ability to share, with the ability to talk about different things, um, but we're not quite there yet. So that's why I think we're seeing more of the online e-commerce companies um, going towards a bit of an offline strategy. You know, Gilt is experimenting with showrooming. And I think what has been successful in that strategy that they've done, you know, starting the same way that you guys did, is to really have, you know, a, a selection of highly curate, curated, personalized items with a stylist there, you know, an expert who can really help them figure out, you know, how do you mix the items together? How do you pull an outfit together um, you know, within an assortment that's already been highly curated in the first place? So I think there's, a, there's interesting opportunity. I also just wanted to quickly touch on the fact that I also think there's a big conversion from offline to online, right? So... Um, you know, we, we, uh, we've heard a lot about Beacon Technology as an example. You know, we, we have in our, in our portfolio a company called Swirl um, um, that just uh, announced recently that they're doing some interesting work. So if you can imagine going into a store, you know, they're actually working with Lord & Taylor and Abercrombie and & Fitch. You can go into the store. You have, prior to that, agreed to either have their app on your phone or you may have agreed to, uh, to or, or they may have a partnership, call it, with a, with, a, with a weather app so that when you're walking into that store, you will get some notification about something. So depending on where you are specifically in the store, they know where you are, they know what you're looking at, they can feed you something uh, in terms of an ad that's very specific to you. Um, and that's very powerful. Also imagine from the, the retailer standpoint, they can see where you are in the store, right? Did you hover too long in this area? Did you hover too long in that area? There's a lot of interesting A-B testing that can be done um, to really try to get a sense for what are the consumer preferences. You know, is it better to have the red sweaters up front or the green ones or wh whatever the case may be? 
Um, and I think at some point there will be an interesting full feedback loop where that information gathered in the store, as you mentioned, can then be used to uh, show you some really interesting and relevant information online as well. But I feel that that beacon technology is still in the early days. You know, the, the merchants, the retailers really aren't sure exactly how to use it yet. You know, it's really the early innings of that. But it's certainly an interesting uh, technology that we're, we're keeping a close eye on. I'm going to actually just add a couple things because I think this is just such a, it's an exciting thing that's happening right now. Um, and whereas many of you guys have not rented the runway, probably heard of Bonobos. Um, and I think what Bonobos is doing with showrooms is, is also really enlightening because you can have a smaller collection of items in store, but the ability to access the full breadth of their portfolio online and have that delivered same day, next day to your home. Right, so you, may go, you go into Bonobos, you actually don't walk out with the product from Bonobos. Um, they call them guide shops, but you try things on and then they're delivered in the exact color you want and your exact size to your home. So I think that that's an, another interesting way retail can kind of play with online. And I think the other thing which I would just give everyone as, as a takeaway is I think that retail and e-commerce play best hand in hand when you can think of a unique experience and kind of like a a sensory experience that someone can have in store when they can't have online. And, and Scarlett touched on this some. So you, you think about, for example, um, rent the runway. It's like, all right, if I'm going to take the time to go in store, how can we make it fun? How can we make it different? So one thing we do is we have you work with a stylist and we book out actually 45 minutes where like you have your personal stylist. We pre-pull dresses that are sitting in your dressing room ready for you based on what event you have, what size you are, what your style preference is. So it's this like celebrity-esque experience. Um, we do fun things like if we know we're coming in for your wedding, we'll have someone there ready to like kind of rate the dresses with little cue cards. So I think when con consumers are taking the time to go into a physical store, they're almost expecting something extra. They're expecting, you know, whether it's a cool magic mirror that they can see, which there's technology around that like changes the color of a dress when you swipe, or, you know, working hand in hand with a stylist, you need to think about how can it become this fun, different thing that they couldn't otherwise get online. And I think there is where you see the most success at brick and mortar currently. Right, so I think we're seeing a lot of convergence um, mobile or online strategies are being applied in the stores, whereas some store strategies are being applied online. I think education is a big part, and for a woman especially, the touch and the feel of the fabric and how it fits your body is really important. At Spylight, it's not only you want to buy what somebody's wearing on TV, but there's an idea that if you know a celebrity that has a body type similar to yours, you can see them wearing this product, and suddenly it's more appealing because you know kind of how it fits. Um, I wish all of us had celebrity type bodies, but you know, we're getting there. Um, so you guys mentioned it a little bit, but data. Data probably plays a huge role in the shift from online to offline. And I think data is severely important in any personalized, competitive online retail strategy. So you've mentioned some ways that data is already being used in e-commerce, but how could it be better leveraged? Yeah, so um, I, I think we're, you know, I, I mentioned we're at the beginning of beacon technology. I think we're maybe not at the beginning of data, but uh, certainly there's a lot more work to be done there. Um, you know, I can talk, talk a little bit to Guild, you know, and Jenny talked to this with respect to her experience as well, but knowing the history of what the customer has done, what the customer has looked at, what the customer has purchased, it just gives you so much data around which to create a very tailored solution. So, you know, the landing page that I will have when I land on Gilt will be different than Jenny's landing page and different than Ali's landing page. And what I see next time will again be different from what I just saw. So there's just a lot of power in data. And, um, you know, and I mentioned, uh, you know, the convergence of offline and online and, and trying to bring that offline data onto online, trying to figure out how to, how to determine, you know, which user is which, where the purchase happened. So there's, there's still more to be done on that front. Um, but the, 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 mo the biggest advantage is really in being able to really tailor the story to the consumer specifically. You know? and, and when the consumer is overwhelmed with so many choices and so many websites and so many apps, so many places to do the purchasing, to be able to really create something specific to him or her is, uh, is really differentiating. I'll just add um, one area that we've struggled with, and I'll kind of share with you what our data-driven solution has been. Um, so that's fit, and fit is incredibly important at Rent the Runway. Again, people are renting for the most special events in their lives, they want it to fit and work out. And we have like one chance to make that happen because the dress gets there the day before, sometimes the day of their event. So it's this important high stakes thing for us. And we actually found that there wasn't really great big data out there that was helping with fit or that was at least letting women feel comfortable and confident about fit. We talked to thousands of women, tens of thousands of women, and we're like, why is this? And the answer we kind of found, and, and we believe as women ourselves, is that it's not just will this dress fit, it's will this dress look good on me? Um, so I think there's that element combined with the fact that like every single woman thinks she has a unique body type, like, and 
she does to some extent, but like she's convinced that like the typical rules of data cannot be applied and she actually needs to see it on herself. So what we decided was the closest thing we could do to get to that was to create a shopping engine that was actually driven by photos of real women. So we had women on Rent the Runway who were naturally sending in reviews of the dresses they had worn. Um, they wanted to share with the community how great they, fe they felt and they looked. And we started asking them, well, what's your height, your weight, your bus size? And women were like, fine and great to share this with us. So they started doing that. And then we now enable women through a concept called Our Runway to shop via those photos of real women. So you can input your height, your weight, your bus size, and you can see tens of thousands of photos of women like you. I think we have over 300,000 photos now, for example. And then you can see, you know, what else did this woman rent if it's someone you identify with or you think, yeah, you know, she has a similar body type. Because there are women out there who have, you know, similar body types and you can kind of imagine that outfit on you rather than on a size double zero model. Um, so for us, that has been a big breakthrough in terms of conversion, just letting women actually feel in the most real way to them, like how a dress might look on them. Perfect. So Jennifer, in my Google stalking of you, I came across a quote that I really liked, which is, Facebook killed outfits. And that is so true. If you wear a dress now to an event, people will take photos. It's all over Facebook and social media. And you can't really wear that dress again. Um, we've also seen on a different note things like, if you Instagram your meal, you get a discount on that. The idea is that the marketing spend behind you sharing this meal with your social network is worth the free meal. Or with Chloe and Isabel, you have women paying off their debts with this e-commerce type flat platform. So what role do we see social media playing and continuing to play in e-commerce, retail, and the future of fashion? Um, so Facebook kills outfits. I'm sure all you guys can relate to that, right? Men in the audience. The worst thing when you wear a dress out, someone posts the photo that night and you can't wear the dress again. Um, for, for me, that statement like summarizes a lot of why we started Rent the Runway. It was this observation, you know, in late 2008 that in our world today, women were more obsessed with ever than with their image. They kind of were their own brands because they were being talked about and posted on all these social platforms. Um, they couldn't repeat their outfits anymore because these photos were being shared and posted. They also had higher aspirations to look and feel great and wear amazing outfits because these photos were being shared with their whole social communities and beyond. They now also had access to all these photos of celebrities and learning about like the brands that celebrities were wearing and aspiring to new different designer labels, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the consumer trends that when we, we spoke to women and we kind of took a step back and said what's going on in the market led to our creating Rent the Runway. And I think it, you know, it just speaks to there's so much changing in the world of social media and the world of you know, digital e-commerce that there's new things you need to do every day as companies to adapt to consumers. And like we challenge ourselves with that still. You know, we view ourselves as a very disruptive company, but we're still like, how can we take that one, two, ten steps further? Because that world around us is changing so much further. So it's those insights that I think tell you that the time is right for a concept like Rent the Runway or other disruptive companies. And I would encourage any budding entrepreneurs to try to like search and look for like what is different today versus yesterday? What's different now than a year ago? And how is that impacting consumers? Yeah, from our standpoint, in terms of social media, you know, we think it plays a critical role right now in e-commerce. You know, a little bit of what I talked about with respect to mobile and that being a key part of an e-commerce strategy. I think social is now that as well. And um, you know, what, what I find is you know, this generation is overwhelmed with choices and would like some influencers to help them to determine what are the right choices, but doesn't necessarily want to give the brands or the companies the ability to be that influencer. Um, I feel that that right needs to be earned for, for some of these companies, for them to become you know, the merchandiser of authority. You know, with a company like Gill, you know, that's built over years and years and years, where they are given the trust and the credibility to be able to make that assortment and that curation on behalf of the customers. But today, I, I find that the influence comes more from peers. So you know, uh, customers are, are happy to share and, 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 and tell each other the stories of what they've worn and, and what they like and products that they are engaged with. And that, that's all great from the standpoint that from a, a, a company standpoint, it, it, um, it really helps them with customer acquisition. It really helps them with customer engagement. And that's all driven by that, that social media and the, the consumers in this generation really not wanting to have the, the company tell the stories, but they want to hear the stories amongst themselves. So I do think social media has, uh, has a really important role to play in terms of socially influencing some of the decision making 
that goes on today. And like I said, you know, from our standpoint, as we think about e-commerce and the companies that are successful, and some of the hardest challenges really are around building a brand and building customers and, and, and reducing that customer acquisition cost, you know, being able to leverage that, that social media channel and, and have uh, customers talk about your product and talk about the brand and talk about the company, or in the case of Chloe and Isabel, tell the story of what the brand did for them, right? So uh, for those who aren't familiar with that, with that company, um, the, the, the idea is to really disrupt direct sales and the company will engage a number of women to be sellers of their jewelry through their own customized online stores and actually they supplement it with an offline component. They have some pop-up shorts so that, that talks a bit to the, to, the, to the concept we were talking about before. So um, they're the ones, they're the brand ambassadors. They're the ones who are out there telling the story and that's, you know, and they're doing that often through social media channels and that's a great way for the company to build its visibility, to build its brand, and to then get the end customers who are actually purchasing the products. Absolutely. So Scarlett, at SoftBank you focus on gamification, uh, media, digital media, e-commerce, just to name a few. Uh, gamification though is a buzzword in the business community right now. So I was wondering if you can speak a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of retail and gamification or e-commerce and gamification. Yeah, so I, I think we've, we've seen it for a while now. You know, Guilt was built on the back of referrals and membership and this concept of exclusivity. Um, and there, you know, there are loyalty programs. There, there are things like having early access, having special access. Those are all gamification tools. Um, and, and, and certainly it's something that we encourage and, and we see. And, and, and those are successful techniques to, to either engage the customers, to get them to purchase, to get them to tell other people, to get more customers. So uh, definitely a believer in gamification as a way to uh, accelerate the business of, of these e-commerce companies. You know, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, Guilt last week did an exclusive partnership with uh, um, um, Kim Kardashian West uh, for her new uh, Selfish book that's actually not launching till next month. Um, and they had this early preview where there were 500 copies that were autographed and individually numbered by her. She, she tweeted and posted about it the day before. I think there were something like 800,000 likes and posts or, or, or all sorts of social engagements. And when the books went on sale the next day, they sold out in one minute, right? So she, she built that uh, anticipation. There's a scarcity factor there that is critical and important in, in really uh, attracting the customers. And sure enough, you know, it, it, it sold instantly. And then there were actually a few other books that sold the same day as well. So, um, you know, definitely feel that gamification is a really interesting technique. I think the, the companies that have been um, the smartest about doing it, and, and what I like better, is when there's already been some demonstration of some value um, that the company has obtained before they give away whatever it is. So as an example, you know, it's not until you've made three purchases that you then get the right to you know, give something away or give a referral or a free gift or something like that, so that you've already recouped up front some of that acquisition cost through the prior customer who already has engaged and already spent some money. Yeah, so I gave the example of our runway, which I think with these photo reviews is, is a form of gamification. We've actually found that often our consumer wants to share and wants to give um, data and information as, like, sometimes even more when you don't give them an incentive or a reward. So I think there's also been a trend of, like, so many almost freebies or incentive things that customers almost, like, are a little skeptical about it. And sometimes just the sheer, like, desire to share with the community or, hey, I looked and felt great in this dress, like makes them want to share on their own, which has been wonderful for us. Um, another, what I, I guess you could call gamification tool that we've seen a lot of success with is called Rent the Runway Pro. Um, and a la Amazon Prime, it enables you for a flat fee of ours is $30 a year to get free shipping and insurance on your orders. Um, and then there's other perks, like you get a credit for your birthday and you get to, you know, I think gift a friend address and all of that. So um, that for us has driven loyalty in a, in a huge way. And so I think just looking at what other companies have done in the gamification space, I know we, we looked a lot at what Guilt had done as we thought about our customer acquisition strategy is, is a, great, a great tool these days. And Amazon certainly has so many people focused on it that I know it's one place <laughs> we, we look a lot. So Rent the Runway is a little disruptive in the fact that it allows access without ownership. You can use this dress and then return it. You don't have to buy it. Uh, I know Gilt and other sites offer designer labels at a discounted price, flash sales and whatnot, and so we see this trend of almost democratizing lux luxury. Uh, what does this mean for big brands, big designer labels in the future? 
So Rent the Runway, when we first started, we were like, gosh, what are designers going to think of this concept? Are they going to like it? Or are they not going to like it? Uh, and one of the first things, we actually the first thing we did before we even like, really knew what our company was going to be called was we co- cold called, emailed Diane von Furstenberg for what we thought was her email address. Um, and it, it turns out it was, but she responded right away in like pink bubble letters, like come to my office tomorrow at 2 p.m. And we're like, is this actually Diane von Furstenberg or what's going on? But two girls in business school were like, you know, type A, we're like, let's do it, let's go for it. And so we walked in there and for like an hour and a half, she told us why she hated our concept. Um, and I, you know, for any <laughs> entrepreneurs there, like this, this happens. I, you know, I think of entrepreneurship as like a flying a plane at low altitude. There's highs and the lows feel like you're going to crash. Um, but what came out of, you know, all of her bashing of our, our burgeoning concept then was the realization that we really needed to service our customers, but also to service the designers because that was, that was half of our business. You know, that's, we're spending money on inventory all the time. And so we started thinking about, well, what's, what are happening right now in the retail world? So it's, it's November 2008, and you have retailers slashing prices. Um, all these big brands are looking for ways to kind of preserve brand value, brand equity, and to build brand value. So um, yet, you have fast fashion companies, Zara, H&M, et cetera, who are really the only brands and companies that are growing in substantial ways during this time. So we said, you know, here's a way for these designer brands to get younger women who currently aren't purchasing their product into these dresses at moments in their life that are the most special talked about moments so that for future, further down the road in life, they're more inclined to purchase from those brands. So you imagine a young woman going to her prom, she rents a dress from Rent the Runway, she gets a ton of compliments that evening, women are always like, oh, you look great, that's the first thing women say to each other, and they talk about these brands. Ten years down the road, when they've saved up and they're purchasing, they're more inclined to stop at that section of Saks or Bloomingdale's or what have you, and they feel comfortable. They, are, they have this amazing memory with the brand. So for us, that's the, the value that we offer to our, our designer partners. We're constantly talking to them. We're sharing data, and we're saying, listen, this is not a consumer in their 40s and 50s, which is actually the average age of the consumers of most of the top designer brands. This is a young woman who's going to look great, who's going to go out there and talk and post on social media um, and start to learn and discover your brand through experiential marketing. And be more inclined to purchase your brand in the future. Um, And we are constantly working on that feedback loop so that we can always be delivering on that promise to our brand partners. Yes, it's interesting. We haven't talked about that, but that's also very much the, the, guilt, the guilt story, um, you know, really being able to put in front of a very young, affluent, you know, fashion savvy audience, you know, these brands that they wouldn't necessarily have known about or even come close to for another five or ten years or whatever it is. So that's a message that really resonates with the brands and that I think is why they work so closely uh, with companies like Rent the Runway and, and Gilt. You know, it's also, you know, on the, on the Gilt side, you know, it, it's really for them a bit of a marketing platform as well. You know, so there's been some, some, some partnerships in the past, you know, as an example, and I, I'm not a car person, I can't remember the name of the car, but it was the, the new Infinity a couple of years ago, Q50 or X50, who knows what it was. Um, but uh, there was a partnership, you know, it was Gilt, it was Infinity, it was uh, Tom Brown and Zach Posen to design uh, a really cool interior specifically to, to that brand marketed to the Gilt audience, you know. And so that was a really interesting way for a brand to have access to this audience and to really be able to tell a really unique and special message and to marry that with some interesting, cool, up-and-coming designers um, that this audience is, is, is in tune with. So, um, you know, definitely uh, at, at that brand level, certainly a message that, uh, that works very well with them uh, in terms of being put in front of this audience. I'd also say that the other thing that Gilt is looking to do is, is to show, you know, the full assortment so that you'll see some, you know, very well-known luxury brands that really interesting prices that really play to that value um, and curation side. But there's also the ability to put in front of this audience, you know, brands that they don't necessarily know, be it a brand from Japan or some new designer out of Korea. So that assortment and that curation is also something that's very interesting. And also to have some of the more basic items as well. So it's really um, back to um, the, the message is, you know, you, you've got the audience, you've got their trust, you know, you, you show them the brands that uh, are as well known, but they may not know, but you also show them brands from other regions that are up and coming and emerging, and they like that. You know, that's discovery, and that's helping them to uh, find something they wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise. Awesome. So I know we're a little bit low on time, but before we let you go, I was wondering if you could speak just briefly to either the biggest challenge you face in your role in your company or any advice that you have for young entrepreneurs, especially women, who may want to start something of their own. Entrepreneur would be you. (laughs) 
I'll okay, well, start. I'll try to address both a little bit, um, and I guess they're they're kind of related. Um, my theme overall would be like, you can do it, and just go do it. So for two and a half years, I ran our warehouse and launched our vertically integrated dry cleaner, which is now the second largest dry cleaner in the U.S. I had zero experience in operations, logistics, supply chain, dry cleaning for sure. I now know an awful lot about dry cleaning if there are questions. Um, <laughs> but you know what? We had to figure it out. We were a startup company. Our business depended on it. We decided it was a competitive advantage for us to develop unique skills in that area. No one was really doing what we were doing in terms of 100% reverse logistics, dry cleaning, all your products, et cetera. So like, who better to figure it out than, than you? And I think you know, just this kind of, especially for women, confidence in yourself, put your head down, figure it out, get it done. Um, I often say like, no doesn't mean no, it, doesn't, it just means not right now. So the Diane von Furstenberg story is another example of that. It's like, okay, there's all these problems constantly being thrown at you, but like, put your head down and just go after it and have some confidence in yourself that like, you know what, you can figure it out. Um, and I think so often that, you know, that confidence is, is what's lacking in women who are starting their own companies. And sometimes it's reflected in um, when they're pitching to investors, and, and Carly, you can, you can maybe speak to this, but first of all, you have fewer women who are pitching to investors. Um, you often have males, uh, rooms of male VCs who can be, whether it's intimidating or they just don't relate to a, a female-driven concept as much, that's another challenge. And then often women are a little bit more um, conservative, practical, whatever you want to call it, in their pitching approach, and they're talking about a company that's a $100 million, $200 million company versus a billion, multi-billion dollar company. Whereas VC strategies are often aligned to pick the one in 10 billion, multi-billion dollar company, rather than you know, a 50-50 chance that a company is going to be 100 or 200 million. Um, so I think that that's kind of worked against female entrepreneurs in the past. I think there's a really great trend right now where you have more and more early stage funds who are actually excited and looking for 100 to $500 million companies. And they are like, you know what, it doesn't have to be the billion dollar plus idea. In fact, there are so few of those that realistically exist. Like, let's get behind a company that we think has a good shot at being a $100 million business. Um, and so I think with that, as well as a lot of other examples and support in the industry, you're seeing a huge turn in the tide of female entrepreneurs entrepreneurs. Um, people are hip to the fact that no one can better understand a female consumption pattern than a woman herself, and that women are consuming about 70% of online goods and products, so it's, it's really important. We see examples every day, like Guilt Group, like Rent the Runway, where this is working, this is happening, and it's making money. And so I think we're at the beginning, and things are just getting better and better. So I completely echo everything that Jenny says. The only, the only couple things I would add is I had no idea when I graduated Yale that this is where I'd be today, um, and there's been lots of paths and lots of turns along the way. So, you know, even some of those things that you're doing that you didn't anticipate doing, everything is a learning experience. All that is great. You know, I'd say jump in. Um, you know, uh, as an early stage investor and a growth stage investor, you know, we love hearing the ideas, we love the innovations. So keep those coming and, and keep trying. I think it's a great time to be an entrepreneur, male or female. Um, but you know, the access to capital is incredible. The access to mentorship is incredible. The access to resources, you know, being able to find resources to help you build things. You can find all that online now. You know, the access to information is incredible. And there are, there are a lot of people that you can turn to so as females. You know, like Jenny said, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky to work with three uh, female, female-led companies, which, which, which is great. You know, I certainly couldn't have said that five years ago. I'm seeing more and more people walking in the door, you know, and, and as Jenny pointed out, you know, the audience for these products is oftentimes the women themselves. So there's definitely a connection there in terms of understanding how the product works and, and understanding the audience. So it's a great, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur, um, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, forums like these are, are great to, uh, to really foster that. Well, thank you both so much, and thank you all for being such an awesome audience, too. Thank you.